Pierre, thank you very much. It's a uh, great pleasure uh, for me to be uh, here in uh, Brussels. And uh, although I uh, knew a little bit about IMI, uh, I had the opportunity to learn more about IMI. And uh, it's a really a grand uh, experiment of uh, really trying to uh, bring together uh, pharmaceutical companies who don't necessarily always talk to each other, uh, certainly not about the products that they develop, uh, and uh, the government and academia to be able to try to solve uh, important problems, and I wish you uh, all, all the best. And uh, today I'm going to uh, talk uh, to you a little bit uh, uh, about uh, one aspect of uh, genetics and genomics uh, and the role that it plays in health uh, and uh, disease. So, uh, <coughs> Although uh, precision medicine and personalized medicine are uh, not new, they have received a great amount of impetus uh, by uh, President Obama uh, when in his uh, State of the Union address in 2015 really talked about uh, precision medicine and the uh, initiative uh, in the United States uh, to promote this idea. And uh, he, uh, you know, defines uh, precision medicine here, and he sort of states that uh, uh, precision medicine, sometimes as people call it personalized medicine, so they're the same, and uh, the promise of precision medicine is delivering the right treatments at the right time, every time, to the right person. And uh, this is the definition that uh, President Obama has provided, and uh, obviously when uh, you know, heads of states, uh, you know, talk about particular aspects of science, they receive significant amount of attention, and uh, th this particular initiative similarly uh, ha has been and continue to receive significant amount of attention, and it has the potential to really change the way that we care for, you know, think about health and uh, welfare in the, uh, as we move forward. The driver for precision medicine uh, is the Human Genome Project. Uh, and I had the privilege of being a part of that. And this project was started in 1990 in the United States uh, by the National Institutes of Health and by the Department of Energy. And initially, this program was joined by the Sanger Center in UK. And then many other countries uh, have joined uh, this effort. And what was really remarkable in 1990 when the project was launched was that uh, the technology that we're going to use to sequence the human genome or the approach that we're going to sequence the human genome was not known. The amount of money that we were going to spend the, you know, to actually sequence a single human genome was not clear. And it wasn't clearly understood as to how long it was going to take to sequence the human genome. Uh, and for all of those reasons, it turns out to be a very bold enterprise. And we sort of have set up a goal at that time to complete the sequence of the human genome uh, in uh, the year 2003 uh, with the hope that we might be able to finish the sequence just in time for the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the structure of DNA. But fortunately, it turns out that uh, we were able to complete that task, you know, both a private and a public enterprises when in about 10 years of time and that effort to sequence one canonical human genome took uh, those 10 years and several hundreds of people working around the world in order to be able to sequence the human genome. And it was estimated that the overall cost of sequencing a single human genome was about $2.5 billion. And uh, immediately after the sequencing of the human genome, it was recognized that uh, our ability to be able to see the blueprint of ourselves really provides a great amount of opportunity to think about how to use that information to improve the health of human beings. And they're also required that we need to be able to sequence significantly larger numbers of human genomes. And uh, however, the cost of $2.5 billion for a single human genome was obviously too big to think about. And there was a challenge that was made to the scientific community to try to think of reducing the costs. And uh, one of the remarkable things that happened over the last 15 years 
is that now it is actually possible to sequence the entire human genome in less than one day at a cost of less than $2,500. That's a reduction in the cost of sequencing by a million fold, and there's nothing in the entire human enterprise in all of our history in which the cost of something you know, has gone down by this much in such a short period of time. And the other thing that happened as a result of that is uh, uh, that the way that you do the sequencing it has completely changed. When we started the human genome sequencing in the mid-90s, and I used to have these series of machines you know, filling the entire rooms you know, to be able to do sequencing, and today, you know, you have a single machine, it's like the ones that are shown here, which sit on the tabletops that can be operated by, you know, not highly experienced people to be able to do the sequencing. And the cost of reagents for sequencing has gone down very significantly. And new technologies are emerging, and uh, this is a technology that was developed by a company in the UK. And as you could see, this particular sequencing unit can pit can fit in the palm of your hand, and on the right-hand side of that, you'd be able to say a USB connector, and that this unit can be directly connected to a computer, and uh, you could introduce a little bit of DNA into this machine, and it would be capable of sequencing single strands of DNA uh, at, at very, very effectively. And actually, this uh, machine uh, was used uh, this year uh, in Africa to sequence Ebola genomes of potentially affected individuals. So the cost of sequencing, which is now about $2,2500, actually promises that it's going to go down probably by another factor of uh, 10 or so. And truly, at, uh, by the time that we reach that type of a price range, it is truly going to become a commodity. Right? So what can we do with all this information that we could obtain you know, from sequencing the DNA from each and every one of us? And uh, so I want to talk to you about you know, some of the possible types of things. I'll tell you a few stories to illustrate you know, how you know, these kinds of things that we talk about can do. So one of the things that uh, you know, the personalized medicine, precision medicine, or the genetics actually do is to first try to help us identify people at risk. And this is very important because everybody recognizes that if you want to be able to reduce the cost of healthcare, it would be great to identify people at risk and try to prevent the disease, and, uh, and I'll show you how it is possible to be able to do that. Second is that there is a significant amount of burden for health, for uh, uh, you know, during the time when a woman is pregnant, and I'll tell you about some new technologies about how non-invasive prenatal diagnosis is uh, promising to change the way that you think about, you know, uh, <coughs> fetal diagnosis. And I'll show you some examples of how the molecular basis for childhood disorders is also going to affect the way that we think about the society. And finally, I also talk a little bit about how this knowledge can help us think about you know, new drugs and uh, therapeutic approaches for varieties of different disorders, but primarily focusing on cancer today. So first question is, how do you keep people healthy? Uh, and uh, so it, because if you can actually prevent disease, that you would be able to save a significant amount of money. And when people think about you know, how do people keep healthy, this is the kind of model that everybody thinks about. It said that if you, you know, eat fruits and vegetables and don't eat sweets and have a good healthy lifestyle, you know, th this would be able to keep you healthy, which is entirely true. But this is not the only component that's important. It actually turns out that the genetic compositions of individuals is also a very important component of them. And I'll tell you how that, that, that is uh, true. So let's just talk first about rare genetic disorders, uh, and, and I'll give you one example. And this one example I talk about is about a disorder called Tay-Sachs disease, uh, which is a rare genetic disorder, which is a devastating neurological disorder, and children who are born with this disorder usually do not live for more than two or three years of life. 
Even though Tay-Sachs is a relatively rare disease in the general population, it turns out that in particular types of populations, especially like the Ashkenazi Jewish population, the, uh, the carrier status for this is relatively high. And, uh, and, and the way that things happened is that um, it, it turned out that, uh, you know, uh, the, the incidence of a Tay-Sachs disease is relatively rare, but if a family had a child with a Tay-Sachs disorder, then a second child born with the same disorder is about, you know, 25%. Uh, however, it turned out that in one particular case with uh, Rabbi Joseph Eckstein from Brooklyn, he had uh, three children, uh, all of which were born with uh, Tay-Sachs disease, and so he decided that he wanted to do something see if it is possible to try to prevent this uh, disease uh, in the Ashkenazi Jewish population. So he uh, sort of set up you know, a foundation, raised a little bit of money, and sort of developed a program. And the program was relatively simple in its concept. And the concept was that uh, all of the individuals uh, in that Ashkenazi Jewish population, especially unmarried individuals, would have their DNA tested uh, and uh, their carrier status for a number of, uh, you know, genetic disorders is recorded and maintained in a, in a secure database at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. And uh, Rabbi Eckstein and many other rabbis would be able to then go to the temple on Saturday morning and be able to tell, you know, the members of the congregation that if they wish to, that they would actually be able to go to Mount Sinai and be able to receive information about their carrier status. That's all that was asked of them to do. And something remarkable has happened. And it turned out that when uh, you know, young people were trying to uh, uh, think of getting married and have a date, and the first date is that you know, they not, nothing happened in terms of genetic testing. The second date, Nothing happened you know, in terms of genetic testing. But when it became a third date, it seems that many of these people now began to go to Mount Sinai and sort of turn in their chips to be able to find out that carrier status. Now, obviously, the reason for that is that by the third date, they're becoming serious whether they want to get married, and they wanted to know whether their spouse is going to be a carrier you know, for this disorder. And just by doing this, that within a matter of 30 years, that the entire disease, Tay-Sachs disease, is virtually eliminated from this population. Just think about this. Because, you know, there's no coercion, right? There are no special types of incentives except to keep the population healthy for one genetic disease. And imagine that we would be able to do that in any society that we would think about if we wish to, that we could essentially be able to do this type of testing for virtually all couples, and we'd be able to eliminate you know, virtually all of these types of uh, rare disorders if we wish to do that. So you think about the ca capacity and what it, what, it, what, it can, what it can do. So this is one example of how you'd really be able to affect you know, change using the, these types of genetic and genomic technologies. The second thing is that uh, what about women who are pregnant and they're worried about whether the child is going to be normal or not? And as uh, many of you know, that it, it turns out that uh, in many, many countries, women who become pregnant at the age of 35 or older are recommended to have a fetal DNA testing for trisomy 21 or trisomy 18 both of which are really devastating disorders. Uh, <coughs> and the way that those uh, kinds of tests were done was through uh, amniocentesis. And the amniocentesis uh, involves uh, insertion of a long needle uh, transabdominally and to try to remove some of the uh, amniotic fluid that contains some floating fetal cells and extract DNA from that and analyze that fetal DNA. In 2011, a new technology really became available, and that technology was based upon the recognition that virtually all pregnant women 
have a little bit of uh, the fetal DNA in their circulation. And the amount of DNA that is present in the circulation varies usually from about one to two percent at the lower end, and as much as 15 percent uh, at the upper end. And so it became possible to actually just take, you know, 10 ml of blood from pregnant women and be able to extract DNA from this and do whole genome sequencing of this DNA. And uh, from that, we can deduce as to whether or not the fetus is normal in terms of uh, Down syndrome and or chromosome 18 trisomy. And you can see the impact of uh, this type of technology. And I could certainly ask, uh, you know, if we ask, uh, uh, women here and say if, if, if a woman becomes pregnant and you say that you have two choices. One choice is to use amniocentesis with this, you know, relatively safe, but you have to go through this trans-abdominal needle procedure, or I take a 10 ml of your blood. And the answer obviously is obvious. Most of them would prefer to have blood drawn, and it turns out that uh, the results that you can obtain from you know, DNA sequencing of the, that's derived from the blood is as accurate uh, or better than actually being able to do amniocentesis. So this is actually completely revolutionizing the way that you think about that. And uh, it is anticipated that probably within the next 10 years or so, there would be no amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling, and this is the kind of technology that we'd be able to use. And uh, this raises some very interesting, important questions uh, about you know, our ability to be able to detect not just these two trisomies, but the technology is evolving. We can actually be able to look at all of the childhood disorders using these types of technologies, and we can anticipate a date not in the too distant future when we'll be able to use this kind of testing you know, to be able to determine the health of the fetus. What about the cases where a child is born with a particular disorder? And uh, it turns out that there are large numbers of children which are born with uh, dis disorders. And uh, there are some instances in which the, uh, the parents go, go through what is referred to as a diagnostic odyssey. They know that there is something wrong with their child, but nobody is able to accurately diagnose what is wrong with that child. And since uh, you know, the way that children are disorders are treated is based upon diagnosis, if you don't have a diagnosis, you have a no proper treatment. And it turns out that genetics can help with this process. And here's an example uh, of a young boy in, uh, uh, in the state of uh, Wisconsin uh, in the US. His name is Nicholas Walker. And a few years ago, uh, at the time that this uh, came to light, you know, he was about six years old, and within that short period of life, six years of age, he has been hospitalized more than 150 times. Each of the times that he was hospitalized, he was hospitalized because he had an intestinal perforation, and uh, uh, the intestinal ma you know, matter you know, goes into the circulation that caused really serious problems, and he had to have surgeries. And the pediatrician finally decided this is, this is impossible. You cannot continue to have this. And said that perhaps he might, you know, that there may be a genetic basis for, this, for whatever Nicholas was suffering from. And asked one of his colleagues uh, at the Medical College of Wisconsin to sequence the boy's DNA. And indeed, it turned out that uh, when the DNA was sequenced, uh, it turned out that he had two genetic variants and that explained this, uh, uh, the, the reasons why he was having this problem. And that diagnosis also immediately indicated that he would be able to benefit uh, from a bone marrow transplantation, which is what happened. And uh, within a very short period of time, Nicholas was healthy. And here he is about a year later after the bone marrow transplantation, you know, back to being normal. And I just give this as an example. And uh, these types of studies have now been done on thousands and thousands of uh, cases. And ne in nearly 35 to 40% of the cases that we can actually find a genetic defect you know, in these uh, children with these diagnostic odysseys. And in all those cases, those diagnoses allow individuals to actually develop a treatment plan for them. 
So this is just a, a show that the ability to be able to sequence these genomes is increasing the number of genes that we're discovering to be important in uh, human disease at an exponential rate. And if this continues, then we would be able to identify all of the genes that are involved of the nearly 10,000 or so genetic diseases that have been described, and that we would be able to do something about that. So it's just, what happens after you diagnose these types of disorders? It is actually turning out that it is now possible to be able to think of new types of drugs and therapies for some of these devastating types of disorders. One of the first genetic disorders that has been discovered in, a, in the uh, 80s was cystic fibrosis. And uh, it's also a, a childhood disorder, which is really also devastating. And, uh, and it turns out that there are a varieties of different mutations in this gene called CFTR that cause cystic fibrosis. And it turns out that it's indeed possible to be able to try to identify you know, the target and the mutations. And one of the companies in Boston actually developed a drug to be able to treat initially a subcategory of these patients. And uh, this is the, uh, a, a young man on the left-hand side really gasping for breath because his lung was full of a fluid, a cystic fibrosis patient. And uh, that boy on the right-hand side, after he began to take this uh, drug, you know, uh, looks normal. So this is really amazing. And, uh, you know, there's a great story about, uh, about this. And he said, you know, this particular one of these patients, you know, they took the drug. And a week later, and, uh, you know, the doctor asked him, how do you feel? And he said, I feel, you know, so something really happened. <laughs> something dramatic has happened. And he said, this, the people with cystic fibrosis, they didn't know how to breathe because they never enough, had enough oxygen. And suddenly, after taking the drug in a week, they really made a difference. And uh, so this is just one example. Uh, 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 and uh, of course, this is now saving the lives of uh, you know, people with cystic fibrosis. There are other examples that you know. There is uh, another company in Boston that uh, developed uh, you know, uh, enzyme replacement therapy for Gaucher's disease and other severe neurological disease, and that also, that ability to be able to replace you know, that enzyme in those patients really saves, saves their lives. So it is really changing. So it's actually possible to be able to think about not only identifying the genes that are responsible for these diseases, but also providing a great opportunity uh, for pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies to be able to think of developing new drugs for these disorders. And I understand now that virtually all of the large pharmaceutical companies have a rare disease program uh, in their portfolio. And that's really going to change the lives of many, many people. So what else can be done? And uh, other types of opportunities are really emerging from, from these types of studies. I give you some examples of them. This is a very interesting example uh, of a disorder called Noonan syndrome, which is one of the most common uh, in a genetic uh, disorders. And uh, we cloned uh, several of the genes that are involved in this process. And what it really turns out is that mutations in one of many different genes you know, cause this disorder and many other related disorders that are all shown here, called Noonan syndrome, Leopard syndrome, and uh, craniofacial cutaneous syndrome, and so on and so forth. But what's really remarkable about all of this is that it turns out that all of the genes that have been discovered to be involved in causing these different sets of syndromes, they're all in the RAS MAP kinase pathway. RAS MAP kinase pathway is very important because it turns out that uh, you know, mutations in the RAS genes or members of its pathway are present in about 40 to 50 percent of all you know, human solid tumors. And pharmaceutical companies have been trying to develop you know, drugs that would affect you know, this pathway for many years and already have many different molecules that are on the shelf. And one of the interesting things it turns out is that there are different types of mutations that are present in these genes 
the most severe of those mutations, which turn on, which result in the significant level of activation of this pathway, you know, are present in cancer. But milder mutations that are present in the germline of these individuals cause this disorder. So now we know all of this, and there are already drugs that are, uh, have been developed for, for cancer. So some of those drugs that may not be considered to be as effective or as potent as they would like to be for cancer can potentially be used to try to treat uh, you know, patients with this uh, disorder. And there are currently some efforts underway to, to do exactly that. So that's an example uh, of something that, that could be done. It also turns out that you could use this information to you know, genetic information and identifying genes to be able to try to develop new drugs based upon that. And one of those most exciting programs now uh, is uh, involved in, in a gene that is known to be involved in, in, in lipids. And there are two new drugs that became available very recently, and both of them you know, have the potential to be able to reduce uh, 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 cardiovascular events, you know, uh, and are found to be uh, so far quite effective and com you know, favorably compare them with the use of statins and that uh, is another group of drugs that really came from the discovery uh, of a gene and a genetic disorder. Other examples uh, in cancer, uh, uh, there are lots of examples in cancer, but I'll just give you a couple of those. And one of those first ones that happened you know, in the early 2000s was the development of a, of, a, of a drug, which is called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, against a target called the epidermal growth factor receptor. And uh, this drug was uh, initially approved you know, for treatment of non-small cell lung cancer patients. However, it turns out that only about 10 to 15 percent of the non-small cell lung cancer patients, you know, respond to this drug. And uh, some of my colleagues uh, at Harvard and uh, at uh, Sloan Kettering have discovered that it is possible to identify those patients who are most likely to respond to, the, to, to these drugs to be those whose tumors contained activation mutations uh, in, this, uh, in this gene uh, for EGFR. And uh, even though the drug was initially approved for all non-small cell lung cancer patients, now the recognition that only a small subset of the patients respond to it, now the FDA has changed the labels for these drugs. And two different drugs have been approved for use for these patients, uh, for only those patients who have mutations uh, uh, in this gene. And, uh, Another example is a, a, a additional sets of drugs that are also for a subset of uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients, and that these two drugs are effective in a very small subset of non-small cell lung cancer patients, about 5% of them, which contain a translocation which results in the activation of a gene called ALK. And, uh, and it turns out that in, in those cases, only those cases that this drug, you know, these drugs are becoming quite effective. So uh, now we're getting a lot of information about these cancers, and uh, there is a, a couple of programs. One is called the Cancer Genome Atlas Program in the United States, and uh, another group called the International Cancer Genome Consortium, ICGC, that all of the European countries and many other countries around the world participate. And all of these individuals have been sequencing the tumor DNA and looking at all of the 22,000 genes uh, in these tumors and many other features. And uh, here is the result of one of those. Uh, and I would just want to make a couple of points about this. So first of all, this is uh, about, uh, about 500 or so non-small cell lung cancer patients. And if you look at them, it turns out of all the 22,000 genes in the human genome, in, non, in this group of cancers, there's only a small subset, about 20 of those genes or so, that are found to be modified in these tumors. If you actually look at a, a single tumor, that's the one that is uh, on the block that you'll be able to see, each of the tumors actually contains only about four or five different types of uh, changes. 
it, but however, it turns out that if you look at different individuals or different tumors, that that subset of whatever four or five genes, you know, is different. And it turns out that in, now if you examine all of these different, you know, 500 tumors, and ask what happens, this is the kind of results that you find. And it finds out that, you know, that all of these, the non-small cell lung cancer now can be classified into these different categories based upon the genetic changes that the tumors have. And I've already told you about uh, two situations. One is that a subgroup of patients that are, have the EGFR mutations that can be treated with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And I told you about the ALK rearrangements that can be treated with another you know, inhibitor of a kinase that's activated. But it turns out that every one of these mutations, there is either a drug that's already approved or there is a drug that's currently in development. So what is really remarkable is that just about 10 years ago, in 2004, if a patient was diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer, the only treatment that was and appropriate for such individual was chemotherapy, which was, you know, and the response rates were only 15 to 20%. Today, nearly 80% of the tumors have one of these genetically identifiable mutations, and as I mentioned to you now, there is a, a drug that is currently in development. So what's really remarkable is that it turns out that there are more than 700 or so drugs in development for cancer treatment, and about 70% of those drugs have a biomarker associated with it, like this one. So uh, efforts are uh, underway to be able to do this type of analysis for all major and minor cancer types and try to be able to obtain this information. And um, so, for example, at, at our own institution, we've done an experiment and be able to say that every new cancer patient that walks into the clinic would actually have their tumor DNA sequenced. And uh, in the last uh, couple of years, you know, uh, we have uh, sequenced the DNA from 17,000 patients for a near 380 genes, most of the genes that are known to be involved in, in cancer. And uh, what's really interesting are the results that are shown here. It turns out that in 90% of the cases, the results from that sequencing actually show actionability. What is actionability? Actionability is that we'd be able to either place that patient onto an approved drug, or that we'd be able to place that patient onto a clinical trial for a genetic variant that that patient has. And, uh, and something else that's very interesting that's happening is the following. You know, before this type of sequencing was available, you know, the, the physician would make a decision on the basis of the clinical, other clinical types of information, or they would, you know, send out the tumor sample for sequencing one or two genes, and they would make the decision. Today, you know, since this program got started, it turns out that all of the physicians are waiting for these results. If the result is a day late, they get on the phone and say, where are the results for my patient? And so why do you, uh, they are not making clinical decisions without this information. So this is the way things are gonna go. And we should think about how to make this type of, uh, you know, technology uh, available for all, you know, patients that they would think about. So some people say, why do you want to sequence all of these different uh, genes? You know, in a given cancer, there may, like I showed you, only 20 different genes or so, you know, that are actually modified. But it turns out there's a very interesting thing that happens. And, uh, and here's an example of a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Dr. Wartman, and, uh, and he used to work at, at, at Stanford. And, uh, you know, while he was a resident at Stanford, you know, he was sort of, you know, getting tired, and everybody thought that, oh, you know, the residents who work very hard, so you get tired, it's not abnormal. Uh, but he went into, you know, and uh, uh, he was trained to become an oncologist. He went in and got himself tested, and it turned out that he had a leukemia. In the meantime, he got a job uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, moved over there, and, uh, you know, 
uh, and as a particular type of leukemia, usually a few genes are mutated, and he had all those genes tested, and nothing was found. And uh, our Washington University had a genome center that was involved in sequencing, and they all said that let's sequence the, uh, him not for just a few genes that are known to be mutated in, in leukemias, but all genes that are ever found to be mutated in all cancers. And it turned out that he had a mutation in this gene called PLIT3. And, uh, and it turns out that PLIT3 mutations were found in other cancers, and there was a drug that was already approved you know, for patients with PLIT3 in other types of uh, cancers. So they thought that you know, they would be able to treat you know, Wartman with, uh, with, with this uh, drug, Sunitinib. And, uh, and they went to the uh, insurance company, and the insurance company said, uh, this drug is not approved for leukemia, so we're not gonna pay for it. And uh, so uh, in the oncology department, they passed the hat around, and everybody put in whatever, $1,000 or so onto the hat, and they initially went in and bought the drug and uh, you know, started treating him, and it turned out that uh, even after the first treatment that he began to respond, and the insurance company relented, and uh, began to cover you know, for the cost of, cost of the drug. But I, the interesting point here is that you know, if, if you're a cancer patient, you, know, you wanna know what's wrong with you. You don't care what the rest of the cancer patients are doing. And uh, so it is these types of sometimes rare mutations that could be very important. And the cost of sequencing 400 genes you know, or 300 genes uh, is not that different from each other. So it's actually important to be able to think about doing all of these different types of things. So what I told you, I gave you a lot of examples now of primarily lung cancer, but it turns out you know, all of the cancers can be classified into these categories based upon the genetic composition. The old way of classifying cancers from the tissue of origin is passe, and we should be thinking about classifying uh, uh, cancers in, in this way. These are all the drugs that have been approved uh, you know, in, in, in the U.S., and many of these uh, drugs are drugs for, you know, are, are targeted therapy drugs. And uh, as I mentioned, 70% of all new cancer drugs have a biomarker. And uh, so in the next few years, as these drugs you know, become, get approved, that we would be able to use this type of testing more and more frequently. So where can we go? And here is one example of that, is a chronic myelogenous leukemia. Uh, you know, uh, until 2001, uh, if a patient was diagnosed with chronic myelogenous leukemia and go to you know, their hematologist, oncologist, they would uh, tell the patient and say, just take care of your business and get ready to go. That was the sort of, uh, because virtually, you know, the long-term survival was not very good. In 2001, a new drug was uh, uh, brought into market, it's called Gleevec, and uh, that really changed the, the picture you know, for this particular cancer. Uh, and uh, uh, the survival rates for these before the introduction and the uh, post-introduction of this drug has been really been remarkable. So now, you know, if, you, if there's a patient that comes with CML, Go, goes to see their doctor, the chances that that patient would be able to have a normal life is extremely good. So instead of having an acute you know, disorder for which uh, uh, you know, people anticipate you know, early death, now you could think about in this particular case a normal life. And this is just one example. There are many others which are drugs you know, that have been available to be able to do that. The other thing that's also very interesting, and I think that uh, all of the pharmaceutical companies certainly take note, is that the fact that in the U.S. there are only about 10,000 new patients with uh, CML. And not a big market, but this is one of the biggest selling drugs, and a few years ago, uh, right now the, the current annual revenues for this is about $6 billion, which would be considered to be a significant uh, drug by uh, any uh, criterion. And the reason why it has such a great you know, revenue stream is because number one, is that uh, it is relatively safe. It exquisitely targets only the particular genetic change that is present in the tumor. It's very effective. And, uh, and those two things really make a difference. In this particular case, it turns out that the, 
you know, oncologists are actually recommending the use of the drug as a maintenance drug. So even though there are only 10,000 new patients, that are, are all the patients that have been diagnosed with CML are continuing to use these, uh, this, this kind of a drug. So my hope, certainly for, for cancer patients, is that the, initially the, this is what we might be able to do. You know, w we really talked about a variety of different ways. One is that if you can identify people at risk, you might be able to prevent it. So the incidence of these types of disorders can be reduced. Two is that, you know, we could think about early diagnosis as some of the examples that I talked about, and I'll talk tomorrow a little bit more about early diagnosis for cancer and the kinds of technologies that become available. And the third thing is the ability to be able to classify these tumors into these different categories and the pharmaceutical companies and biotechnology companies that are developing uh, exquisitely great uh, drugs. And one thing that we did not talk about for cancer is immune therapies, and, uh, and we can talk about them separately. And all of these things are, are making a difference. So it's not just cancer, but for all of the human diseases, there is an opportunity for us to be able to make a significant amount of impact. So I, I, I conclude by saying that the use of the principles of precision medicine or personalized medicine uh, in all sectors of society where we're thinking about the health or in terms of business could be very, very advantageous. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, I'm Beppo Opoke from uh, the Veneto Institute of Oncology, Padova, Italy. I'm, I have no, no doubt about your conclusion, but I want to do one provocative answer, question. Is from, uh, prevent, uh, from uh, precision medicine to precision prevention. Like in, I, I, I'm thinking to oncology, obviously, and to the possibility to develop one, one, uh, some, some efforts in, in uh, preventive cancer analysis in DNA, circulated DNA. That's my question. So you, you, you're absolutely uh, right about uh, prevention, because that would be the most ideal situation. So first of all, say, how do you, you know, prevent, uh, prevent something? So obviously, you know, if we look at all the human population, each of us would be susceptible to develop something. You know, I might be susceptible to develop a cardiovascular disease. Somebody else might be susceptible to develop an autoimmune disease. Somebody else might be susceptible to develop cancer, and so on and so forth. So you can't really think about preventing for every disease, so you need to know what you're responsible for. And so it is indeed possible to be able to do that. So I give you an example of how things have changed. As you, many of you know, that every newborn child, for example, would have a little bit of blood from their heels when they're newborn, and that is saved on filter paper, and that blood initially that and was sent out for testing. And in the United States, in all states, the state pays for the testing, and they initially started testing this for one single disorder called phenylketonuria which is very important, and if people had children with phenylketonuria, the devastating neurological disorders can be affected just by having a diet without phenylalanine. And, uh, and that was near 30 years ago. Now, you know, the same blood you know, filter paper is sent, the, and the state labs do a test for 35 to 40 biochemical disorders. And the reason why is that the cost of being able to do that testing has really gone down tremendously. So my view about this is that if, you know, it is possible to actually, we have enough DNA from the same filter papers now to be able to do sequence all of the 20,000 genes. <laughs> and if you do that, and, and the cost is gonna go down very significantly in the next few years, that we would be able to identify the risk for many, many you know, disorders, not just childhood disorders, but adult onset disorders, and depending up then upon what the susceptibility for the disease is, that we might be able to think of plans for preventing that particular disease.
Fascinating talk, thank you. Uh, the question is, in oncology, we have so many examples of successes. How about non-oncological diseases, uh, autoimmune disorders and other disorders? How can we transport some of these learnings in oncology, both regulatory pathway, companion diagnostics, et cetera, so we can accelerate the development for other diseases? Uh, great, uh, a great question. I, you know, the reason, you know, why our efforts in oncology were successful is that we clearly knew what the target is, right? Like the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the target is EGFR, right? And there is a drug that exquisitely, you know, is developed to be able to, to be able to, uh, for, for that target. Three is that in many, unlike, you know, classical types of therapeutic agents, these are safe, right? And so those three things really made, made the difference, right? And uh, so there's nothing magical about uh, cancer. I think that, you know, we are beginning to identify the targets and the ones that I, uh, the ex couple of examples that I mentioned to you, but that's happening across, you know, a whole bunch of different things. We, you know, for many of these genetic disorders, for example, we know what the targets are, right? I mean, you know that in your own field, like for example, you know, juvenile onset of diabetes, that we know what the genes are, the Modi genes, right? And uh, we think about you know, how you would be able to modify the effects of those uh, genetic mutations, that we'd be able to you know, develop drugs for those? Absolutely, yes. So I think, you know, so th th that's the reason why I'm saying that there is a true revolution today because we're able to identify the targets and a lot of people who are afraid of tackling these so-called rare disorders now are beginning to uh, you know, tackle them and successfully. And from, from a pharmaceutical point of view or a biotech point of view, they actually have the potential to bring in you know, very significant revenues. That's a great uh, driver. Yeah, Mara Diersen from the Center for Genomic Regulation in Barcelona. I have a, a comment. Uh, of course, there are many cases of like uh, success, but uh, when you face the clinical problem, it's very complex, as you perfectly know. There are many things that are not monogenic, and even even being like uh, in the case of Klivek that you mentioned. Uh, some successes there. There are also patients that develop new mutations, new tumors, etc. Right. So, um, I would like to to know your opinion about how to tackle this complex disease problem, which is the one that we have that we face in most of the cases. And what is your opinion on the the concept of network pharmacology? Thank you. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, if we think about, uh, you know, the kinds of diseases that affect the population that have a significant amount of financial impact or, you know, like obesity and diabetes, uh, other types of disorders like that, which uh, really have a very significant amount of impact on society. And, uh, you know, there has been an effort, uh, you know, for the last 15 years to try to identify first, uh, you know, whether or not those diseases have a genetic basis for them, and if they have a genetic basis to try to identify the genetic variants that are responsible for them. And the answer to the first question uh, is indeed it turns out that many, many of these complex disorders have a significant amount of so-called heritability, and it means that they have a genetic com com you know, component involved in them. <laughs> However, it turns out that the number of genes that are actually involved in all of those things is quite significant. And they get, that's true you know, for diabetes, for psychiatric illness, and so on and so forth. And we've been able to identify a number of those variants that are important. However, each of them have a small effect size. You know, increase the risk from 1 to 1.2 or something which is not very significant. So <laughs> we, we have not been able to 
uh, as effectively be able to identify people at risk for, for, for those types of disorders as we would like to. But I think that's beginning to change uh, now uh, with the more information that we might be able to identify people at, at, at risk. So that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that Pierre asked me, said, think about what are the kinds of research efforts that uh, all of us have to undertake? And this is one of those efforts that, that, that you talked about, the very important. So thank you for your talk, and I think everyone would agree that science has been amazingly advancing over the past decade. And no one knows where we are going, basically. So I mean, if I would ask you what's going to happen in 2050, you probably won't be able to say. So I think that's fine, and I think scientifically we will be able to go very deep and broad, etc. But there's something that is not really moving that fast, is the the, the citizens understanding the science and the evolution of science. And my question is about genetic testing is still a problem. So I've discussed with some colleagues today. And how do you, how do you get the people to accept to have their DNA to be, uh, to be given? And still there's a question about data privacy and so on. So this is not going at the same speed for good reasons, of course. OK, can you comment on that? And how do you see that evolving? Very, very challenging thing that that, that you talked about. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a I'm a cancer geneticist, and uh, you know, I had the opportunity to be able to go and talk to uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, you know people, both in academia uh, and uh, in community oncology practices in the United States. And uh, the issue that you talked about becomes very, very important. First of all, despite all of the evidence that we have about the, the, the genetic basis or the fact that all of these drugs that are approved you know, with a genetic biomarker associated with it, it turns out that there are still many physicians who are reluctant to be able to use this type of testing. And, uh, uh, and and there are all types of reasons. I'm surprised when people say that I don't want to have the whole genome sequence because I don't know what to do with the information. I, because I showed you, like in the case of cancer, you treat, you, you sequence the tumor. There are only four or five, you know, important changes. There are not that many that can handle. Uh, so I, I, the answer to the question is uh, education. And... Um, so both you know, from a patient point of view and uh, from a physician point of view, I think that we have a big challenge in terms of education. And uh, so to be able to you know, show that these ideas of uh, precision medicine that we talked about, that we know about, uh, are really important that they would have the ability to be able to change you know, the quality of life that they have, whether they're healthy today or whether they have a particular disease. Uh, and uh, I'm ashamed to say it, that it turns out that you know people in academia uh, or you know highly educated doctors uh, are highly conservative. <laughs> they, want to, they don't want to change their ways. So we need to be able to show them, and the only way that we could show them is to actually you know provide real examples uh, of how effective a particular you know technology or a particular you know therapy or treatment would save the li lives of their, of their patients. We're going to take one more question, and then we'll, we'll have to move on, I'm afraid. We should, uh... Pierre, will you allow me to make a comment on the last one as well as a question? Um, just uh, to maybe put the other side of the story, uh, ROS1, a mutation that occurs in lung cancer and other cancers treated by crizotinib. In uh, the United States, there's a group of patients who have self-aggregated and then have subsequently self-aggregated with 130 patients worldwide, all got themselves tested, showed they were ROS1, and that now have approached a clinical foundation 
to actually fund a clinical trial. So I think on the other side, there's actually a lot happening, and, and patient advocacy is an example of where, and they're not all in the United States, they're in Bangladesh, Brazil, Italy, so it's a really interesting story, uh, which we've been working with among the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. But my question was, we talk a lot about precision medicine. Traditionally, surgery, oncology, chemotherapy is how we actually treat uh, cancer. Do you think we're also seeing the same developments in precision surgery and precision radiotherapy? Or is the focus all on precision medicine? Sorry, Serena, a bit provocative. <laughs> yeah, you, uh, so you know, the people really talk about the definitions of personalized medicine, precision medicine, and other types of things. And um, uh, all of these uh, things that we talked about are really focus upon individual. But to be able to alter the health of the, we need to be thinking about populations also, like you were suggesting. And actually, um, you know, Susan uh, Desmond Hellman, uh, who used to be at Genentech and uh, now uh, uh, m moved uh, to a foundation, recently wrote an editorial in Science and uh, say what you're saying, that it is really important for us to be thinking about using these precision medicine principles, not just to individuals, but to populations. And, uh, not necessarily, precision medicine doesn't necessarily mean just to use genetic and genomic information that, like I talked about, but use all of the information about the patients and populations and use that information in a precise way to be able to try to develop drugs and treatments. And she thinks that if we think about world health, that's how we need to think about that. So you're absolutely right about sort of directions we need to go.